Peridian said. Nice to see you again. I didn't think the other restaurant was so hot either. The guests were amused, but he put my business friend off his poisson provençal. He ordered chopped liver instead. To my surprise, he left me a large tip and was the first customer I got to like. I got to like the others too after I learned three lessons very important for pious people, which you only learn from life. First, being a doormat is different from being devout. It doesn't help you or the people you allow to threaten you. Secondly, if you suppress your anger, it will only boomerang back at you with migraines and depressions. The waiters taught me to express it, but not too heavy and with good humour. Third, Loving humanity is easy, but liking its individual specimens is jolly hard work. Oh, you learn a lot when you also serve and stand all day and wait. At the conference, we compared notes about our childhood. I'd been born in London and he in pre-war Poland, which was bad news for a Jewish child. But he was here, he'd survived. Your parents must have been pretty clever. No, he said thoughtfully, not clever, just naive. When the Germans invaded from the west in 1939, they fled east and found themselves in the Russian zone. The Russians then asked the refugees if they wanted to return to their homes in the German zone, and my family was so homesick they said yes. So how did you survive? Ah, he said, it was a trap. The Russians wanted to find out who was unreliable. My parents fell into it, and we were deported to Siberia. How dreadful! Not really, he said. After we were deported, the Germans invaded Russia. But we were in such a godforsaken corner of the country, no army ever came our way. That's how we survived. It's the case of Sod's Law in reverse. I dare to quote this conversation verbatim because Sod's Law is now ensconced in the latest edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, which relates it to Murphy's Law, which defines the apparent perverseness and unreasonableness of things. Why, for example, the phone rings just after you've soaked yourself in the bath, or why your toast always falls marmalade side down, or why Arsenal always score a goal as soon as Peter Hobday has left his TV to make a cuppa. I suffer from it most on solemn occasions. At the cemetery I lead the cortege behind the coffin to the grave, only to find they haven't dug it, and I have to tell everyone to come back at tea time. Or, just when I've cooked five fish some fancy way, a guest turns up with his new fiancée and her former boyfriend, and not even a computer can divide five small souls into seven. But Sod's law wins out against all of us in the end, for death is so perverse, we all ask, why me? Why now? It's a real test of faith when you're brought up sharp against Sod's Law, whether it's comic like a ruined dinner or tragic like a terminal illness. If you can say, I might make something out of that mess, or perhaps there's even some goodness hidden in hell, then your faith is stronger than Sod's Law. Now, at first sight, Sod's Law seems reasonable, faith does not. So why am I for faith? Like much in religion, the evidence is slight but sufficient. All the people I know who followed their faith have not been made foolish by it, or even seem silly to me. On the contrary, because they believe beyond reason, I become more sane and courageous. I can live with more confidence because their belief is strong enough to say to Sod's law, clear off. For many students now, the real news won't be announced over the radio, but through the letterbox. Dear Miss or Mister, the letter says, you have been awarded a degree in higher Babylonian studies with third-class honours. It's a relief, of course, but can you earn your bread with bits of old Babylonian? At a college bar, I listened in to two worried students. If I get a first, I'll try for the foreign office. And if you don't, Dad says become a parson, he mumbled defensively. Don't be defensive, dear chap, I wanted to tell him. God can make do with second best. He has to. That's all he ever got from me in the beginning. If I'd been offered a fellowship, a minister of quite another colour might be talking to you this morning. But knowing this has stood me in good stead. People join congregations for the oddest reasons. They may not want to live by their faith, but they certainly want to die in it. And your cemetery is conveniently close to the buses. 
Some join because of the bridge and some because their boss is a member too. Whenever I want to rise up in righteous indignation, I remember my own motives weren't that pure either and I become much nicer. If you flock, get on your nerves, I pass on two bits of advice my rabbi taught me, adaptable to any denomination. Any congregation which doesn't want to get rid of its rabbi aren't real Jews, and any rabbi who lets them get away with it isn't a real rabbi. Also, remember, if they were saints, you'd be paying them to minister to you, and not vice versa. You can cope quite well with all their shenanigans, provided your own faith stays firm. But, alas, it doesn't. It gets more dicey as the years go by. The texts which seem so straightforward in college don't stick when you apply them to people you know, and scholars can't decide if Moses is man or myth. But there's a different type of evidence, inside, not outside you. To be blunt, you invoke God to make a living, and to your relief he came. And for a while you see him everywhere. He's the beggar by the door and the treasurer who hands you your paycheck. He's the AIDS victim, the chairman and the spouse or lover you'd like to do the dirty on. It's more than you bargained for. You can, of course, turn your back on him and he'll go away because he won't stay where he isn't wanted. But then you'll become bored or bitter, as ministers sometimes do. But if you accept him, you'll have to grow like him. It's tough going but you'll become your own evidence and convert your third-class degree into a first-class blessing. See, you've got your first at last. Oh, it's a pity no one will ever know it except you. Who says God hasn't got a sense of humour, dear chap? Others commit sins. I shall commit a cookbook. But Rabbi Blue, is a cookbook really necessary? Of course not, silly. A stew is a stew is a stew, whether it's rump boiled in old burgundy or an old boot in a beef cube. You put one herb in, you take another out. You crush a clove of garlic and you shake it all about. As my colleague Rabbi Green says, no matter how you slice the salami, Lionel, it's still the same salami. But never in the field of human history have so many been so full and fixated on food. They don't just want to eat the stuff, they must read about it too. I puzzled over the problem at the funeral of a nice old gent who met me each year to sort out some business affairs. Instead of a cup of coffee, he insisted on dining me at an expensive eatery quite out of my class. I couldn't choose the cheapest dish because it seemed insulting. The second ditto, and the third I could cook myself. The other prices soared into the stratosphere and made me much too edgy to enjoy anything. We both gave a sigh of relief as we left the restaurant and each other. I brooded over the problem in the funeral chapel, and the penny dropped. I knew why he invited me out. He couldn't stand me, but felt guilty about it, so he stuffed me instead. The meal was marvellous, but tasteless, because it covered his lack of love, and it must be the same at those banquets when world leaders threaten each other so politely with atom bombs over the pretty four. All that smoked salmon is a smoke screen, which hides the horror and their lack of trust. And it's the same with me when I gorge from the fridge at night and never feel full. My belly feels hungry, but it's my soul that's starved. The missing ingredient which makes any meal special isn't material, so you can't buy it in supermarkets. It's spiritual, and so you may have more luck in a church or temple. Now, my friends in Eastern Europe may be knocked by all this dismissive talk about luxuries they've been denied so long, well, President Bush is in Poland, and so is our own Brian Redhead, and between them I'm sure they'll arrange things better. But I hope the Poles won't just change one materialism for another, because they can do without our drug culture and self-destructive greed. Western bananas, popcorn and fizzy drinks are fine, but not enough. They too lose their taste unless they're cooked with the milk of human kindness and served with a slice of the bread of heaven. She had silky brown hair, and long lashes framed her liquid brown eyes. These she half closed as she gazed at me with a sideways glance. The convent building slept in the heat haze behind the trees. We were alone. As I came closer, she suddenly pressed herself against me. We lay side by side in the grass, and I fed her cow parsley, 
Occasionally she butted me in the belly to express her feelings. It was Emily, the convent goat, who had taken a shine to me, and when they came to lead her back to her pen, she again half turned to give me one last lingering look. To be the recipient of love is a wonderful thing, and that night I lay awake fantasizing. She could bed down in my garden shed, I would feed her cow parsley, and she would feed me her yogurt and reduce my milk bill, an arrangement both reasonable and Franciscan. Next morning before breakfast, I rushed to her meadow and halted in shock. She had changed into a very nasty goat, unlike the loving animal of yesterday. She stood on a hillock, braying boastfully and butting the other nannies. She gazed at me briefly, bared her teeth, and brayed again in triumph. At breakfast, the nice nun who attended to the goats and the guests saw I was hurt. Don't judge her harshly, she said. That goat has suffered. Her sad story turned my anger into pity. Emily was a brown goat in a herd of white ones who never completely accepted her, and having no kids, she had lost all status in her herd, which obsessed her. Cleverly, under the guise of love, she had manipulated my attention because the attention of any human being gave her the status she craved and schemed for, and now having got it, she had no more use for me. Like many modern people, she rejected the real things of life for their shadow. I said farewell to the kind nuns and returned home. My letterbox was so jammed with junk mail I could scarcely open the door. A coloured credit card would make me the envy of other borrowers. An exclusive travel ticket would entitle me to use a lounge and loo only sat on by better class bottoms. A club announced it was exclusive to executives. Enjoy the goodies, but beware the poison bait, I said to myself. Enjoy the good opinions of others, but don't let your self-respect depend on them. Remember poor Emily, who sacrificed true love for status, the substance of things for their shadow. Oh, it's a pity she couldn't shoo her way out of the garden into the chapel, to meditate on the time when God will sort out his sheep from the goats. For when all we creatures pass before him, he will gaze into our substance, not at our status in the herd. Such knowledge now would serve us well in the life of the world to come, and it would give us better balance in this world too. Now, you may know the stories of a man called Horse and a fish called Wanda, well, here's the sad story of a goat called Emily. Ponder it well. I went to tea with my friend. She poured tea calmly from her old silver teapot, passed me cinnamon toast, and told me she had only a year to live. How should she use her time? Write a book on English spirituality, I suddenly said. She looked at me inquiringly, but I couldn't give her the reason. She'd have thought I was over the top. She was the finest example of it I knew. She was a lady. She died as she completed it, anxious about washing her own smalls and putting her papers in order to spare her family and friends trouble. Once, when we were discussing her book, she said, Lionel, which English person helped you most spiritually? And though I hadn't thought of him for years, to her surprise and mine, I suddenly named the old king, George VI. At school we all got mugs to celebrate his coronation. It was a worrying time for a small Jewish lad in London's East End. In Germany old Jews like my grandparents were forced to wash pavements, my cousins died in Spain fighting fascism, and closer to home, when Mosley tried to march through the East End, my father landed in hospital and my grandpa in the police station. My parents said the new king was a decent chap, but, of course, he had no chance against such gangsters. He was not need and stammered. He dreaded public appearances, and people said he wasn't that bright. But he was a gentleman. So during the war we trusted him, because we knew he'd never walk out on us, even if we were invaded and lost. And he would never collaborate with evil as smarter and cleverer people did, because it isn't a thing gentlemen do. Now, in modern times... Official saints, visionaries, and mystics have been in short supply over here. We even import our evangelists from the Americans. Our spiritual speciality has been ladies and gentlemen. 
I mean the real thing, of course. You don't become a gentleman by wearing a blazer with a set of club buttons, nor a lady by a pastel twin set and pearls. It isn't dining with inn people at restaurants. As Grandpa said, a gentleman isn't a gentleman because he comes out of a door that says so. It means passing plates at parties and being polite to people you don't take to. It means keeping your word and appointments and doing your duty without making a song and dance about it. It means not saying or doing things you'd like to, because ladies and gentlemen just don't do them. It means putting your papers in order before you die, to spare your family and friends the trouble. It doesn't sound exciting. It's not spiritual cake, just boring old bread. But you can survive on your dull daily bread. You don't need fancy cake. We found that out when it was a matter of life and death, when there was a war on. Preaching to adults is easy, but teaching religion to a confirmation or bar mitzvah class is tough. But that's the job they usually hand out to curates and trainee and experienced ministers, which was me. My classroom was a disaster area. The children shouted and threw things. I threatened and bribed them with chocolates to buy five minutes' peace. I'd no experience, and they spotted it. I was also disorganized because my home life was falling to bits, which, thank God, they didn't spot. But they broke me down, and one night before I left the synagogue, I wrote out my resignation. On the way home in the underground train, I saw one of the ringleaders moodily soaring through an armrest with a penknife. I crossed the carriage. Stop that, I said, and couldn't help adding in self pity. I am resigning. You can make some other poor bee's life a misery. You can boast about it back home. Not going home, he said sullenly. I didn't want to either, so I stood him a sticky bun in the station caff and heard his story. Not an abnormal one. Fragile marriage, wife swapping, divorce, stepmother. I didn't give him advice, only attention. But he must have appreciated it, because next lesson he punched a boy who threw a pellet at me. I took that kid out to tea too, heard him out, and some of the other mafia as well. Behaviour in class didn't become wonderful after that. But the nastiness had gone. It could have been wonderful if I'd had the time to treat them all as special, but I didn't. I was preoccupied with my own problems. I wanted to be special too, which was a pity, because there's an extra emotional emptiness inside every hooligan that craves for special treatment. But the world has more takers than givers, so it's tough luck for them and for us. Of course, there's plenty of plastic carrying around. But you can't trust it. Fulsome apologies on British Rail, which sounds so personal but can't be. Personalised letters printed out in word processors. Universal prayers which ask too much for too many, so you don't believe any of them. Teachers' threats and police patrols keep the lid on the troublemakers, but can't cure the problem. And the caring professions, ministers, social workers, and such can't care enough because the demand is insatiable. So they begin to feel badly treated too, and give up, like this psychotherapist who tottered to the canteen bar after his first day at the clinic. Give me a brandy, he says. Then he turns to an older colleague who's placidly consuming a cream pastry. How can you listen to those people all day and keep so calm? Who listens? Says the other, shrugging his shoulder. Well, God listens. That's the only hope. It saved me. But how do you tell that to a troublemaker in a confirmation class or a football stadium? I read a fascinating book by a Jew who'd converted to Islam. My enthusiasm upset my teacher. You should refute it, Lionel, not recommend it. The rules of the religious Cold War said so. And I sinned again when I advised a member of my synagogue to transfer to the Orthodox, as she needed her religion more clear-cut. My wardens were not amused. The old rules were especially unjust to converts, who were acceptable if they converted to you, but traitors if they converted out. Take my friend Charlotte Klein, a traditional Berlin Jewess who died a Catholic nun, and wrote against anti-Jewish prejudice in the church, annoying everybody. She deserved thanks. And after thirty years, I still remember another lady, now dead, an elderly widow without children. 
who spoke a strange Yiddish. She applied to join the non-Orthodox section of the Jewish community, but the old rules couldn't cope or do justice to her life experience. What are the differences between Judaism and Christianity, we asked. Are there any? she said, puzzled. We stared back, more puzzled. Don't you see any differences between your childhood religion and your present one? Oh, we light candles at different times, she said. They do things differently in England. But what happened to your childhood saints? Funny, she said. They haven't been around a while. We discussed her history. A shy, pious girl from the Atlantic coast, terrified of the traffic, who'd come over here to work. Two equally terrified Jewish refugees took her in, an elderly woman and her son. And when the old woman became ill, the girl took over the household and its religious duties. And when she died, it seemed only natural to marry her son and continue the household on its pious course. Now the son had died, but would they bury her beside him in the cemetery? What religion do you think you are? a colleague asked gently. I don't know, she said distressed. Does it matter, sir? Well, the Cold War rules again in another cemetery. In Auschwitz, Catholic nuns confront Jewish protesters for the occupation of Europe's greatest graveyard. If only the Holy Spirit could get in, something new could happen. The nuns might say, We meant well, we didn't understand, we're sorry, we'll go. And the protesters reply, Don't go, sisters, the ghosts don't need us, but their descendants do. Let's work together to spare them more horror. But the Cold War ways have become habit, so they feel religious and right, and more confrontation creates more prejudice, and prejudice more murder. Religions like people can be prisoners of their own past. Why not seek God in the future, in the new heaven and new earth he is working to create? This morning I'm going to give you some gratuitous advice on marriage, a state of affairs I've never experienced and at 59 not likely to try. Yes, yes, I've got a nerve, but I do know quite a lot about it in reverse, because for 18 years I dealt with religious divorce for the reformed Jewish communities in this country. Some mysteries never became clear. When I asked quarrelling couples why they got married in the first place, most could only say, well, Rabbi, it seemed a good idea at the time. But it did become clear that those short relationships can work for a while on fantasy, long-term ones never. They need honesty. So when I marry couples now, for their sakes, I don't avoid the inconvenient question, do you both mean the same thing by the ceremony? It's better to face it before with love than after with recrimination. And though I feel a spoil sport, I tell them they won't stay the same. They'll change, and so will their needs. But if they can be honest about them with each other, they'll be able to renew their marriage, for within a good marriage you divorce and remarry many times. The advice is the same for religious relationships. People complain that God has died on them. Often it's because they've grown up, but their religion hasn't been allowed to, and holiness without honesty just isn't on. In my life, I've gone through many gods, all within the same religion. There was the god who would save me from Hitler if I didn't walk on the cracks between paving stones. There was the god who'd set the universe, of course, to suit my convenience. There was the god of my own group, partial, 
and therefore dangerous. God help me make them, God help me break them. If I hadn't, my religion would be as fragile as the marriages in my files. So that's why I sit in an empty synagogue now, trying to relate my religion to reality. For next Friday night the Jewish New Year begins, and it's time to renew my faith, for neither it nor I have stood still in the past year. I can't give you the traditional apple dipped in honey, the sign of a sweet year. So instead, I'll give you this New Year story about them, to warn you against shameful cover-ups. Some congregants spotted their rabbi in a most unsuitable opulent restaurant just before the New Year. Rabbi, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm only here for the art and culture, he said hurriedly. Look at that beautiful ceiling and those superb chandeliers. Suddenly, to his horror, the waiters brought in a boar's head on a silver salver. The rabbi gulped, grabbed a pot of honey and said, And just look with what style they serve the apple. May your year be sweet and honest. I'm not good at machines and only learned to drive late. I practiced on a hotted up mini, urged on by advanced motorist friends who impressed upon me the importance of flair. Well, I certainly drove with a certain something which impressed the jags and mercs my mini overtook. When I stopped at traffic lights, making wild hand signals, one of them pulled alongside me, put out his hand and shook mine. I still wonder what he meant by it. I bet a colleague I'd passed the test before him. Well, I had five goes, he had six, but I wore my dog collar, which he said wasn't fair. But I said it wasn't fair when I backed into a garage painted green like the lawn. Then he said it wasn't his fault a collie crossed the road during his hundred-point turn. It wasn't a collie, but a cow which nearly scuppered me, a highway code cow. What would you do if you met a cow at night on a country lane? Stop, I said. Silence. Well, what do you want me to do, milk it? To my surprise I passed. Perhaps it was that dog collar. But driving's out for the next few years because I've had a blackout. And after all that effort, it feels like a bereavement. It leaves behind the same self-pity and anger which I have to flush out of my system before they do me more damage than the loss of any driving license. But how? I've no mystic cure-all, only some ways which have worked for me and friends. If I think of cousins in concentration camps who would have given their all to suffer my little loss, the feeling of unfairness goes. It's crude but effective. I also remember my own sermon about life being a school with a compulsory course in giving up for everybody. I also make God a present of my losses, which sounds daft but works. You can practice it at Christmas. And a friend who lost her family and fortune gazed at a statue in a church, and her bitterness drained into the statue. Holy objects don't reflect our anger, they absorb it. Try it and see. I project my problem onto friends, not statues, in a peculiar Jewish way. Two friends meet after some years and chat. Then one says, sadly, You haven't once asked me how's business. Oh, I'm sorry, said the other. How's your business? Don't ask. But you may have to ask. Perhaps you suffered your little loss when the stock market wobbled. Perhaps your pension took a knock or you're stuck with a mortgaged home you can't sell. I've no cure-all, as I've said. But these ways may help you clean up the inner mess your little loss has left in you. And if, by the way, you do meet a highway code cow at night in a country lane, do ring the police. Here are some seasonal Christmas tips you might want to jot down. Are you ready? If you're rummaging through the dirty laundry looking for the least dirty shirt for the office party, Wear it with a big bow tie because it hides the soiled neckline. If you've drunk too much at the said party, drink two pints of water to help against dehydration. If money's tight this Christmas, what about some cheap treats? Soak kipper fillets in lemon juice, then drain and slice them thinly against the grain. They're supposed to taste like smoked salmon, and they do, sort of. A thermos of hot chocolate by your bed is a great comfort if you wake up worrying. And for outer warmth, put some foil behind your radiators, then the heat gets reflected back on you. 
If you feel alone, try singles clubs at churches and synagogues, but you are liable to bump into your ex. You can sometimes get a free shampoo and set if you're modelling for hairdressing students. Rabbi Blue, Rabbi Blue, this is all very informative, but is it really religious? Funny you should ask that, because I once attended a conference on what is religion, but I never learnt the answer, because like many middle-aged men, I was having prostate problems. As the experts trooped into the conference hall, I frenziedly buttonholed them, whispering, Where's the washroom? They waved their hands about vaguely. Find the porter, dear chap. He'll show you. Now I must get a good seat. I was in agony until I finally located it in the basement. And while my colleagues considered the nature of religion in the conference hall above, I considered the same question from below. Was religion what was going on in the conference hall above me, with its theories, debates, points of order and procedure? Possibly. They might be the manifestations of truth. They might also manifest prejudice and power. Are Christmas cards, Hanukkah cards, turkeys, cranberries, candelabra, potato pancakes and presents religion? Yes, possibly. They might be the manifestations of care and kindness. They might also manifest silly spending on status objects. So what is religion? Bible words from the synagogue service floated into my mind. Is it not sharing your food with the hungry and providing the homeless with shelter? clothing the naked when you meet them, and not turning away your fellow flesh and blood? And, I mentally added, is it not showing a rabbi in agony the way to the washroom? But, Rabbi Blue, Rabbi Blue, your hints about hangovers and dirty laundry were so earthy, so lacking in soul. Were they? I remembered another saying from the rabbis this time. A religious man looks after his own soul, and other people's bodies. A hypocrite looks after his own body and other people's souls. The lover in the Song of Songs liked to browse among the lilies at the bottom of his garden. I prefer the tinned tomatoes and baked beans in my local supermarket, for mild consumerism is just as soothing as meditation. I always assumed that baked beans just appeared like crocuses in spring, but some weeks ago I met the backroom boys who put them there, and they proudly showed me their technology, computers and distribution systems. Our business isn't glamorous, Rabbi, they said wistfully. It hasn't got any connection with yours. But they did themselves an injustice, because God created us with souls and bodies, so we need both blessings and baked beans, religion and the retail trade, to survive. I remember the post-war years when baked beans were in short supply and Britishers then lived like East Berliners now. People said that well-stocked shelves in the shops would automatically make everybody kind and content. So spirituality and all that see-through stuff was a bit redundant. And they were right for a while. People were good when they'd never had it so good. But in 1968 the big boom turned into a little bust and people changed from nice to nasty overnight, and racialism revived. Good time goodness without God just didn't have enough stamina. The hippies, of course, made the opposite mistake. They were for the spirit and against business. Well, business just took them over and absorbed them into the pop and fashion industry. Last week, the experts said there's another tight year ahead. High mortgage repayments may knock out that family holiday or new car. But just because business isn't booming, there's no need to turn nasty and make everybody else's life a misery. Let your body and soul help each other. Bring them together. If you remember your religion in the supermarket and that man doesn't live by bread alone, you'll save yourself a lot of silly spending. And when you're in church or synagogue, remember your material needs. And then you won't misuse religion for escapism, for you can't live on blessings alone either, and nor can others. Your body and soul can purify each other if you let them, and I suspect God made us a mixture of spirit and flesh for just that purpose. Not everything, of course, can be transferred. One backroom boy asked me if the technology which made the distributing trade efficient would work for religion too. Regretfully. No. Take that wonderful computer, for example, which can translate the scriptures into any modern language. Well, they fed in 
The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And what did they get out? The gin is full strength, but the beef is flabby. I ask you, good morning. We're in Worcester Cathedral, making a film on English religious history. The TV crew huddle round their camera, and I lean against a convenient tomb near the remains of St. Wolston, if they still remain, that is. A powder puff appears from nowhere and removes the shine from my nose. Surprised, I swallow my chewing gum. Action! shouts the director. I step forward and speak fiercely into the camera. This is a holy and historic place. Then I sneeze, because the powder has got up my nose. Cut, says the director, and I lean back against the tomb and wonder how real actors use their leftover time between takes. Now, Greta Garbo thought of her next hamburger, and this gave her that yearning look in Queen Christina. And an opera singer I know, who hangs about on stage in drafty tunics, mentally marks off the items on his laundry list. I try to meditate on St. Wolfston, but leftover time makes me think of leftovers in my fridge. Can gravy or custard redeem them? Probably not. After all, why were they left over in the first place? Action! cries the director. This is a holy and historic place, I proclaim urgently, because the cathedral tea counter is closing. This time we get it right. St. Wolfstan is in the can. Whoopee! But I worry if my nose will glow on the box. I'll never know, because in the cutting room we find with two saints too many. Wolfstan's also a leftover. Never heard of him, you say. Never heard of Wolfstan, mate. Where have you been all your life? I only thought about him again yesterday morning when my leftover saint came back to life as I was reading the papers at breakfast. Tribalism, I read, was returning to Europe. Nationalists were butchering each other in the Caucasus and closer to home in Ireland, and German nudists had been burnt out of their holiday camp by Corsican patriots. There were the same national passions in Wolfstan's time, for he was the Saxon bishop when William the Conqueror reduced the Saxons to serfdom. To save everyone from civil war, Wolfstan didn't try to cut the king down. He cooperated with him instead, and together they stopped the cruel trade in Saxon slaves from Bristol. He knew you mustn't try to love your own people more by loving other people less. For God isn't your tribal totem, but God of your enemies too, a lesson which Europe, with all its theology and cathedrals, still hasn't learnt. So come back, St. Wolfstan, we daren't leave you out. Knee-capped Irishmen, mourning Caucasians, and nudist Germans need you now. In Eastern Europe, you never got hot news from the newspapers, but from jokes whispered among friends. What's up? Have you heard the latest? Well, a Stalinist party desperately looks for new members. If you recruit one, you'll get $50 reward. For two new members, you'll get $50 and permission to leave the party yourself. And if you recruit three, you'll get $50 and a certificate that you are never a member of the party in the first place. In its heyday, Stalinism worked rather like a religion. It had its sacred writings and heresies, and it demanded complete commitment. No wonder, then, some disillusioned party members now turn to religion. A market economy may satisfy your hungry body, but only belief can satisfy a hungry spirit. Forty years ago, I was having my first doubts about materialism, but I didn't find the changeover to religion easy. Three problems worried me, and my experiences then may help others now. The first was not what religion said, but how it said it, through stories, myths and parables, not scientific statements. And if you're modern, this makes you want to give up. But Stalinism wasn't as scientific as it sounded, just as Bible stories aren't as artless as they seem. Next problem. Did I have to believe the lot? Forty years ago I tried to and got religious indigestion. Take a text like, I once was young, and am now grown old, but have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Well, the psalmist may not, but I have, many times. So I consider the statement, but I don't pray it. And now, Bullseye, are these religious stories fairy stories? 
comforting opium, as Marx said. What's the evidence? I first looked for it in books and other people, but they either contradicted each other or had feet of clay. And then one morning I realized you have to become your own evidence by letting the God you worship refashion you. I should have guessed. Religious questions always boomerang back on you. An old-time party member told me in tears the revolution got hijacked because of personal ambition, greed and power. We tried to understand society to change it, he said, but we didn't start with ourselves. And this epitaph reminds me, have you heard the latest? Some hardliners pray for Stalin to return to earth. Come back, comrade Stalin, and restore the party. OK, says Uncle Joe grudgingly. But I warn you, this time no more Mr. Nice Guy. Good morning. For my birthday, I present myself with an away day from life. I put on scruffy clothes and in a nearby cafe breakfast on Cocoa Pops, open a Regency romance and opt out of reality. My lord, Desdemona dimpled at him, you must honour your debts of honour. We can live on love. My sweet, he whispered urgently, his steely hand gripping the yielding satin that cradled her heaving bosom. "'Twas all a jest. My seat and three chateaus crammed with wattos are yours. "'What ho, my lord,' she breathed roguishly, tapping her fan on his granite jaw. "'I sigh with satisfaction. As Granny said, love is nice, but it's nicer with noodles, "'and boy, has he got a lot of noodles. "'A lady on sticks trips over my foot.' recognises me and plonks herself down. She stares at my plate, but it's only Cocoa Pops, thank God. Then she stares at my book. It ought to be graver and grimmer. It's got a happy ending, she sighs wistfully. I could do with one. She points to her feet. The hospital says they'll get worse. I get her a Nichols cake while she peeps at the last page. What'll they be like when they grow old like us? They can't, I say they're programmed for happiness, and God programmed us for growth. Growth means change, and change brings pain. It's the price you pay. Rabbi, in the geriatric wards, they weren't growing. They were disintegrating. So I tell her about a teacher in a Rudolf Steiner school 40 years before, who told me even though your body and mind crumble, your soul still grows. Only we don't see it because souls are see-through. She spent her spare time trying to teach a brain-damaged kid with only a few months to live to wave a rattle. And do you believe that, Rabbi? Regretfully, I turn away from Desdemona, gloating over the wattos in her chateaus. Well, what do I believe? I believe we're on a long journey to perfection, wherever that is. On the way, we go through many experiences, many existences, perhaps. They all take us forward, if we accept them though some seem like failure. This was serious stuff, so to take her mind off her feet, I promised her my book after I'd read the ending. She smiled in anticipation. Later on at the station, I smiled too, because being 60, I'm now entitled to a senior citizen's rail card. My mother rides the buses, I shall ride the trains. And to cheer all of you up on a chilly Monday morning, but not too much, because for a lot of you it's Lent, well... Though happiness isn't the purpose of our life on earth, there's more of it around than you might think, provided you don't get snobby about small pleasures or become greedy and clutch. So, have a happy day. Religious instruction in my first school was a real turn-off. In school assembly we sang all things bright and beautiful and led by a teacher on a Franciscan kick we thanked God for Sister Snowdrop, Brother Buttercup and other exotica in London's brick jungle. But being streetwise Stepney kids, what about Brother Mosley and Sister Dolecue and Auntie Cancer who called on Grandma uninvited? Did we thank God for creating them too? But if you left them out, religion became like Toy Town, Swallows and Amazons, kids with nannies and nurseries, like the Regency romances I read now when life gets too tough. Years later, when I gingerly re-examined the Bible, I was pleasantly surprised to find life's unpleasant parts left in. 
Man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. In sin my mother conceived me. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Not reassuring stuff, but recognisable. But something in us can't leave it like that. We demand happy endings, and millionaires make their millions providing them for us. That's what westerns, musicals and TV soaps are about. They say Billy Wilder went to see Sam Goldwyn with a project for a film on Nijinsky. It's too downbeat, Billy, said Sam. Sure, he comes to the West, becomes a famous ballet dancer and packs them in. But look what happens afterwards. He goes mad, he thinks he's a horse. Don't worry, Sam, said Billy. We'll make sure he wins the derby. Well, that works fine in films. But what about real life? Can I provide you with a happy ending that's eluded saints and seers for centuries? I'll have to be snappy about it because I've only a half a minute left. So listen carefully. There is a sort of happiness in religion. It's in the Passover and Easter stories. But it doesn't come for free in the way we expect. Though we can't supply happy endings for ourselves, we can provide happier endings for each other. Look, there's a phone by your elbow. Ring up old so-and-so you quarrelled with years ago, though you don't remember who said what to whom or why. Now, he might still quote you your words back verbatim. Never mind. You can make a happy ending happen. You only risk a rebuff. And though Auntie Cancer still visits uninvited, there's all the difference in the world between coming back after your chemo to a cold and empty bed sit and someone coming to fetch you and sitting you down with a kiss, a cuddle and a cuppa. Now, of course, I could go on to provide you with even happier endings. But my half minute's up, sorry. So you'll just have to provide one yourself for someone else instead. That's the only way we'll all ever get one. So have a happier day.